Right. Um, so I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew, Dr. Andrew De Silva. Uh, Andrew is a consultant cardiologist in heart failure imaging and a senior clinical lecturer at Geist in St. Thomas's. Within his uh, research interest has uh, been uh, he has been looking on LV uh, hypertrabeculation, I would say now, in athletes, uh, and he was supported by both CRI and BHF. Uh, Andrew, we're really looking forward to listening to your talk, especially now that the new guidelines are giving a new perspective uh, in a previous standalone entity. Uh, so the stage is yours, and uh, we're looking forward. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dimitra, for the kind introduction, and, and thank you for um, you know, including me in this really educational uh, series. Um, let me aim to share my screen and make sure I'm doing things properly. Excellent. Can you see my uh, um, slides in the, you know, in the appropriate display? Yes, on presentation. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, um, right. So I, I've set objectives for this talk, if I can advance the slide. Let me see. There we go. Uh, so the three main objectives that I set is to discuss the limitations of, of how to measure or how to assess uh, LV trabeculation with cardiac imaging. Uh, I've included a couple of uh, illustrative cases to demonstrate the, the issues around sort of trying to label uh, an individual as having left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy, but exactly as Dimitra pointed out, um, you know, this is a term in itself that's uh, antiquated and probably not appropriate for reasons I'll come to. Uh, and thirdly, to highlight the value in there being a, a population of healthy individuals who have probably been accused of, of potentially having a cardiomyopathy, but having a, such a low risk phenotype uh, with ventricular trabeculation that, that they, they should have their, their health restored to them, as it were. So, um, around the 1990s to 2000s, this uh, you know, potential novel uh, cardiomyopathy um, began to raise increasing interest. And similarities around the, the, the phenotype, as it were, or the look of excessive trabeculation were drawn with the fetal heart. Um, the difficulty with that is it was hypothesized, but never really developed or taken further, that there may be this, this embryological process of compaction uh, that's disrupted and disturbed and leads itself into a cardiomyopathy. But I include a reference there at the bottom, which was a, a privilege for me to contribute um, to, to a paper with uh, essentially de developmental anatomists um, describing that actually there's no such uh, compaction process, certainly not in, in, in mammals like humans, chickens and mice, uh, that you know that what happens is that there's a higher proliferation of compacted myocardium that outstrips uh, trabeculated myocardium and, and leaves the, the final phenotype in, in many mammals and birds, but that's not the case uh, across other species in the animal kingdom. And so, you know, many of these ideas do deserve um, some challenge. Uh, and initially, when this entity that was felt to be a cardiomyopathy was described, the most severe presentations clinically were brought forward. And it was felt that um, th there was this triad of left ventricular systolic dysfunction, ventricular arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death and stroke and thromboembolism formed this, this triad of, of a cardiomyopathy with increased trabeculation. Uh, and this triad, this idea was sort of recycled from case report to paper to textbook, but again, not really challenged as to whether these uh, clinical outcomes might have been associated with different confounders uh, and, and not um, sort of purely down to a, a trabeculated phenotype. So if we look at the kind of evolution of the scientific literature, the majority of, of the, these sort of publication volumes are case reports. Uh, and, you know, around the 1990s, 2000s, there was a proliferation of, of proposed measurement tools across different imaging modalities um, you know, that, that were felt to try and achieve a, a sort of diagnostic description. But if you look over, the, you know, about the 30 years of, of intense study into this field, in comparison with other cardiomyopathies, and I include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy here as examples, there really hasn't been the same degree of genetic and um, biomolecular pathophysiological understanding into how uh, you know such a phenotype develops and how it relates to 
changing to, to disease and certainly nothing approaching uh, a consensus criteria for diagnosis or, or consensus on management. Um, so it really questions whether it's valid and appropriate to use trabeculation of the left ventricle as a, as a phenotype in itself of a disease process without greater biological understanding of the process. So this is our, our sort of classical way to describe cardiomyopathies. First of all, grouping them uh, into how they look and then uh, at an individual level with the patient trying to understand through family pedigree and genetics why um, the, the, the phenotype looks the way it does. Um, and you know, for, for a long time, many believed that uh, sort of a, a non-compaction, a hypertrabeculated cardiomyopathy or left ventricular non-compaction would find its its home nestled amongst these other phenotypes. But it was accepted that there was a considerable degree of overlap and, and increased trabeculation could coexist, certainly with a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype or, or restrictive cardiomyopathy phenotype, as well as other congenital abnormalities. So in more recent uh, guidelines, the update of the ES see a sort of task force criteria for, for cardiomyopathies. Um, this ha has, has essentially been relegated um, to, to be a trait and not, not recognised as a distinct uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, as, as perhaps some, some had viewed it to be. And I, I won't read this uh, quote out is in its entirety, but I'll, I'll allow you to, to have a look either now or later. Uh, and really, if you agree with the ESC task force, that pretty much ends my talk. And we say, yes, you know, it's time to declassify this proposed cardiomyopathy, uh, leave it as an associated trait um, and accept that, you know, these five uh, phenotypes are better descriptions of, of the cardiomyopathies we might face clinically and have guidance in how to manage them. But it may be that, well, in one sense, this may be a bit controversial. Um, you know, there are many uh, spending a lot of time in this field who feel that, you know, perhaps particularly in the in the paediatric aspect, that this group has not been studied well in isolation and contaminated with lots of other um, sort of non-cardiomyopathy phenotypes to not really be well described and, and pull out that understanding of the pathobiology. Um, and, you know, the other issue with this is, it you know, it leaves the clinician with a bit of a quandary. If a patient uh, is referred to a specialist or has an imaging test that highlights you know, there is a, an excessive amount of ventricular trabeculation. What are the next steps in investigation? You know, how, how is this best worked up and managed? Um, so the rest of my talk will sort of focus on, on covering those points. This is a busy table and you're, you're not meant to, to sort of absorb it all, but you know, it will be made available to you later. But this is effectively the proliferation of solutions to a question which has no answer, a, a, an impossible task, really. And that's taking something that's complex and has a 3D geometry, uh, a trait that can be varied across different segments of, of the left ventricle and trying to express it in, in a simple ratio where objectively there may be the most trabeculation and comparing it to, to the thickness of the compacted wall adjacent and using that as a distinguishing point to say this is the difference between normal and pathological where there isn't even a, a relative appreciation of the normal distribution of trabeculation across the population. So you can understand in the small numbers of, of patients, these um, proposed ratios have been validated from uh, or you know, have been designed from or derived from and, and not had any external validation as, as it would be difficult without there being a gold standard. Um, you know, this poses a real problem and understandably there's very little agreement regarding, you know, in which um, uh, view one should best try and measure trabeculation, which phase of the cardiac cycle. And I include a, a second reference there from uh, from Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, which is a very elegant um, paper looking at experts who have been researching and active in the field of measuring trabeculation for over 20 years and independently using the same echocardiographic criteria 
disagreed about 35 percent of the time as to whether they were dealing with a normal heart or, or some potential uh, hypertrabeculated cardiomyopathy or pathology and even when brought together to mutually review these studies together there was disagreement in 11 percent that speaks to the level of objectivity there is in trying to make this assessment and measurement how much of the cardiac apex um, one feels comfortable excluding or including and it, it, you know, it, for individuals with 20 years experience of, of, of trying to measure something, it makes the job difficult for, for anyone else trying to draw a conclusion as to the importance of, of the degree of trabeculation. So it really is, you know, in terms of how you can measure trabeculation, a real wild west of different approaches by different modality. There's another sort of fallacy that um, that you know I, I sort of experienced a lot during my training, which is that uh, MRI is just better at echocardiography, certainly at visualising the apex and in making a diagnosis of uh, hypertrabeculated left ventricular cardiomyopathy. You choose MRI, and that's going to help you know you come to the answer and measure things better. But there's a bias in that. And actually, the tools that exist for cardiac MRI to measure trabeculation are probably oversensitive. And they're already 12 times more likely, if you average across these different populations studied in this meta-analysis, likely to call a non-compaction cardiomyopathy or, or cross the threshold of hypertrabeculation, where there may be a, you know, a huge amount of normal individuals inappropriately given that label. Um, so, I'm not saying don't do the MRI scan. Actually, the MRI scan has a huge amount of value in assessing a patient with an excessive amount of trabeculation, but for other reasons, looking for evidence of myocardial fibrosis, looking for scar, looking for that deeper phenotype of a, a clearer, consistent cardiomyopathy, regional wall motion abnormalities, more subtle evidence of congenital anomalies that might be associated. But if your question is, let's re-measure the degree of trabeculation, MRI is just more likely to tell you, you know, you're finding it. This is a really elegant study, and it's one of many, but probably one of the largest with the longest series of, of follow up to demonstrate the point that if you just take uh, individuals and in this case, a, a multi multi ethnic um, observational cohort uh, studied longitudinally for a long period of time, you can fulfill uh, MRI based criteria of uh, abnormal trabeculation in over a quarter of cases in at least one segment by uh, um, Professor Stefan Peterson's criteria, uh, which you know is approaching a, a kind of upper tail of a, a population in terms of the degree of trabeculation. And looking over nine and a half years, if you separate out the degree of trabeculation into quintiles, there's no association that you're seeing more major adverse cardiac events or dropping cardiac function, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, the more trabeculated you are. And interestingly, in this population, you know, there wasn't particularly a difference in the trabeculation you know, sort of pattern or prevalence across this, uh, uh, ethnicities, which, which differs from, from some other papers. But, um, you know, a, a reading from this group, um, particularly Professor Peterson, who, who's uh, written an, an excellent review article in, in Jack uh, recently, this, you know, it's a good example of someone who's, who's understood and matured over time, developing criteria as an undergraduate in Oxford, now as a professor at Barts, really understands that, you know, there is difficulty in using measurement of trabeculation alone in defining a problem. And actually, you know, by, by taking that approach, you label a lot of people who just exist within the normal population of normal variation as having a problem when they most likely don't. The key is to look deeper into the phenotype than just the trabeculation. So what I'm going to do now, that's enough sort of words, I'm going to go to pictures. And I don't normally demonstrate two sort of case reports side by side, but I think in this case, it really helps to highlight the similarities and differences that I want to bring out in these two cases. So on the left, you're going to see imaging and clinical data that pertains to a 35 year old white European woman um, who was entirely asymptomatic, but attended a cardiac risk in the young charitable screening program, which seeks to investigate any young person who's willing to have an ECG um, and, and to see if there's any evidence of abnormality that could signal a, a problem. But she came to that uh, screening program with with a bias. Her father had been diagnosed with a cardiomyopathy and unfortunately passed away in his 50s due to multi-organ failure. So the pretest probability of a problem here is, is probably 
view is certainly higher than other people in the general population attending a, a young person screening program. On the right, uh, I'm going to show you the, the clinical data of a 40 year old white European gentleman who's really an athlete, although it's, you know, he has a different uh, professional career at, at a recreational level. The amount of cycling he does in his evenings and weekends really is quite a competitive level, quite steep uh, ascents, quite, um, you know, sort of difficult trails that he follows. And he presents to, to a specialist with some occasional dizzy spells. Um, that's noticing usually at the end of a, a strenuous cycle. No reduction in his performance, no other symptoms, but uh, an important, well, potentially important family history that his father had a pacemaker inserted, man clear on the indication, but aged at the age of 61. So perhaps young uh, for most people having pacing indications. So on the left, the 35 year old woman, this is her ECG, uh, this is her echocardiogram uh, at, at the screening event that was undertaken. And although I'm doing it slightly out of order, I'll show you the ECG later, but just in terms of a uh, hypertrabeculation talk, just getting to the meat of, of what I'd like to show you, which is that this performance of this heart is impaired with an ejection fraction calculated at 45%. There's this strong degree of trabeculation. You can see it's web across the apex. Um, and I'll show you the short axis view underneath as well, uh, apically demonstrating this, this uh, trabeculation and its variation across the segments um, in that view. Now on the right, going to the 40 year old male cyclist, you can see again, there's a, a, a striking degree of trabeculation, quite a symmetrically enlarged heart uh, going, uh, you know, beating a little slower, uh, it, fitting with uh, his athletic performance. And again, in the short axis view, you've got, you know, a more symmetrical degree of uh, trabeculation all the way around the myocardial segments. Um, ejection fraction here is about 60%. Right now, moving to the cardiac MRI. So on the left, the 35 year old woman. Again, you see this really dense trabecular web and mesh work across both ventricles, quite quite uh, clearly highlighted on, on the MRI scan and just below no evidence of myocardial fibrosis here. And on the right, I show you the, the 40 year old male cyclist again, you know, perhaps compared to the echo, the degree of trabeculation doesn't look so marked. It's probably finer rather than coarse, but but certainly there. And again, no myocardial fibrosis uh, seen on this MRI scan either. Now here come the ECGs, and I'm sorry if I've left them a bit smaller, not projecting particularly well, but on the left, the 35 year old woman with a very suspicious family history has or R wave progression, quite small limb lead voltages, T wave inversion from leads V3 to V6, effectively you know, quite a pathological uh, ECG. And, you know, uh, as part of her clinical management, as things develop over the years, she undergoes genetic testing and is actually found to have two uh, likely pathogenic mutations, one in lamina C gene and one in the mice in heavy chain seven. Um, on the right, uh, the clinical course of the 40 year old man who's cycling is quite different. His ECG is not entirely normal. There is a left axis deviation. There is poor R wave progression with an unusual sort of repolarization pattern in V2. Uh, T waves are upright throughout. It's the kind of ECG you might um, you know, check the, the, the chest of the patient to see if there's any evidence of pectus, maybe look at how the ECG leads V1 to V3 were placed on the chest uh, and, and you know, satisfy yourself that they're in orthodox positions. Um, but reassuringly, no arrhythmias on this gentleman's ECG monitoring. His symptoms later resolved just with simple hydration during his uh, sporting activities. So very benign, nothing of concern there. So the 35 year old woman on the left, unequivocally, she has a cardiomyopathy of some species. What you call it and how you integrate the trabeculation into the description of this probably doesn't matter. You're managing her as a lamin DCM. She needs inherited cardiac conditions, care and follow up, family screening. Uh, ultimately, over her time, she has an ICD implanted in, in the local cardiology centre where she uh, attends. The 40 year old man on the right, Maybe a normal variant repeating that ECG. You know, there, there may be some concerns that that may warrant some follow up. It's unclear that family history may become relevant over a period of follow up. It may not. And some of the changes we see, perhaps it's just a physiological adaption to the degree of exercise he does. 
maybe it's suitable to delabel him because there really isn't maybe you know sufficient evidence that he bears a, a, a cardiomyopathy and, and i'd put that question to you i think you know there, there's some ambiguity in his presentation i think it's useful to look deeply at the phenotype and consider what reassures us and what doesn't and so this was a really interesting useful paper um, published quite recently in the last couple of years and it was a, a sort of collection of again you know uh, individuals patients accused of having a hypertrabeculated cardiomyopathy across about 12 um, inherited cardiac condition services in Spain and within that group you've got individuals who have some cardiomyopathy species there there is a, a, a clinical event rate of heart failure uh, systemic embolism ventricular arrhythmia but within that group, there's probably a lot of healthy, normal individuals who just on their imaging have been identified as having a, an increased amount of trabeculation by, by whatever threshold is used. And they developed this interesting safety algorithm, which we use in our MDTs. And looking at that lower risk population, if the ECG is normal, if the cardiac performance is normal, ejection fraction about 50%, there's no late enhancement on MRI, there's no evidence of a family history of cardiomyopathy. Looking at this uh, cohort of patients over five years had a very had a zero um, major adverse cardiac event rate and therefore, you know, very good prognostic group. And we use that as well as looking very closely at the phenotype of such patients who end up in an inherited cardiac conditions clinic in, in our MDTs at St Thomas's Hospital. So with the help of uh, Dr Rachel Bastian and some of our other colleagues in the ICC service, every six to eight weeks we hold an MDT where we accept referral of, of any cases with an excessive amount of trabeculation, but particularly you know, we hope to understand of those low risk cases, you know, how many are sitting in the ICC service going through annual or, or checks every two years that actually it may not be necessary. There is not enough evidence of a cardiomyopathy to, to justify concerning these patients. We look to see if we can safely delabel those who we can identify as low risk and, and trying to distinguish saying, actually, you're accused on an echo of having a cardiomyopathy, but really over this time and with the test you've had, we can't see strong evidence to support that. It provides some consistency and management. So across the service, it can be very useful at this time of having you know, tremendous waiting lists to be able to discharge some patients safely and say, you know, we can use uh, you know further appointments um, to to other individuals who who will better use you know ha have better utility of it. But for that individual, there's potentially a release of from psychological morbidity, over testing, over diagnosis, iatrogenic harm from from the inappropriate labelling of worrying about someone's ventricular trabeculation and hopefully in the future we aspire amongst our our own practice and our colleagues to be able to to probably you know better put into words this finding of an isolated you know curious amount of increased trabeculation and how we be able to use deeper phenotyping to distinguish that from a cardiomyopathy or if alternatively if we find evidence of cardiomyopathy be it, be better able to describe that in a more clinically meaningful way that's useful in managing the patient so in summary, and I hope I've kept to time, there, there is no process of ventricular compaction that's that's been proven and therefore left ventricular non-compaction is not the correct term to, to describe a, a, a ventricle or a concern. That the measurement of trabeculation, there is real no there, there is really no true threshold that exists that you can use any modality to distinguish between normal or pathological. You have to use other um, assessment and, and, and other aspects of the phenotype to draw that distinction. Excessive trabeculation, I, I agree with the ESC task force. I think this is a trait. I think it's common uh, to other cardiomyopathies and congenital disorders and disturbances for reasons that we don't yet fully understand. Um, but I don't think it, it provides incremental prognostic information on its own and therefore there are patients who have probably been given a left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy diagnosis that deserve sort of declassification um, with you know the focus and the attention of their assessment paid to the rest of the clinical phenotype and managed appropriately. I leave you with uh, a few references to some I think really useful papers that do summarise the more contemporary view and and you know again many in line with the ESC view of of looking into low risk populations and and being able to to appreciate um, the, the the evolution in understanding we've had in in increased trabeculation. And I hope uh, you've enjoyed the talk.
Thank you very much, Andrew. So again, an, another incredibly eloquent talk taking us through uh, LB non-compaction, or as you say, another kind of phenotype, so to speak. But um, um, uh, again, we'll take questions um, coming uh, going forward. But uh, I think the, the the one thing that you demonstrate from the last publication there was a needle in the haystack. It's one of the challenges that we often have with uh, cardiomyopathies in general, because you know, so-called rare but not so rare conditions and trying to distinguish between them, trying to identify different patterns uh, is what we're all well acclimatised to. So thank you very much for that talk. 